Hi guys, um, my name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist. And today I wanted to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is atrial fibrillation. And I wanted to talk about uh, strategies to try and improve symptoms in atrial fibrillation, okay? So I'm going to start from the very beginning so that uh, you understand where I'm coming from. And then I'll talk to you about an interesting study about what the best way is to try and improve symptoms in patients with atrial fibrillation. So the first thing to understand is that any condition can do one of two things or do both, okay? There are two things that a condition can um, cause and there are two things you want to try and get better or you want to improve when you go to see a doctor. The first thing is a condition can shorten a person's lifespan or put them at risk of something that could affect them, okay? So a condition can cause risk. And the other thing that a condition can do is it can affect quality of life, i.e. cause symptoms. So, uh, you know, you can have symptoms. So you can have uh, with atrial fibrillation, for example, you can have symptoms like breathlessness, you can be tired, you can get chest discomfort, you may feel dizzy, okay? And then there is the risk of atrial fibrillation, uh, and that is the risk of things like stroke or heart failure, etc. It's very important to realize that the two things don't have to be related, i.e., just because you don't feel well or you have symptoms does not mean you have a greater risk, okay? So, for example, I'll give you an, anal an analogy. If I get up in the morning and I get dressed and I walk down the road, okay, how I am feeling is my symptom, okay? That has no bearing on whether I'm likely to have an accident or not. The accident is the risk or my lifespan, you know, that's what that governs. So people who feel great can still have a life-threatening event or could still be at risk. And people who don't feel great may not be at so much risk. So there's no relationship between the two. And it's incredibly important to understand that because once you understand that, you will start realizing that the treatment has to be geared specifically towards these two things. Okay. so. Let's talk about risk firstly, okay? Keep it separate from symptoms. Now, the risk from atrial fibrillation is largely reduced by two things, okay? Number one, lifestyle, okay? If you improve your lifestyle, then the risk associated with atrial fibrillation of stroke, of, a heart, of a heart failure, of death is reduced. Number two, anticoagulation or, or um, <clears throat> medications that stop blood clots from forming is the other way you cover your risk or reduce your risk. And anticoagulation, if done well, reduces the risk from atrial fibrillation in people who are at a higher risk by 60%. And lifestyle also offers uh, a significant benefit in terms of reducing risk. Then there are symptoms. Okay, and that's how a person feels. Now, some people don't feel anything. Great, you cover their risk or you reduce their risk. And if they don't feel anything and they feel okay in themselves, you don't need to do anything else because what are you going to make better if they feel fine? However, some people have symptoms. Okay, now to understand how symptoms um, should be treated, you have to understand why the symptoms are happening. And in atrial fibrillation, there are two main reasons why people get symptoms. Number one, atrial fibrillation is a condition of rhythm disturbance. The heart is beating irregularly, and because it's beating irregularly, it is not beating as effectively as a regular heart rhythm, okay? So, we know that the atria, the structures at the top of the heart, which are the ones that stop working in atrial fibrillation or stop working effectively in atrial fibrillation, contribute to about 15% of the amount of blood that comes out of the heart. So if you lose that atrial activity, 
then your heart becomes less efficient and pumps out less blood than you would normally expect to pump out. And that reduction is in the order of about 15%. So for some people, it could just be the fact that you have lost that 15% that makes you feel not so good. It may make you feel a bit more breathless. It may make you feel dizzy. It may make you feel tired. Then that is one reason why you get symptoms. The second reason why you get symptoms is because atrial fibrillation is often a disorder of rate. Okay, So with the irregular rhythm comes the other problem, which is that the heart rate can go up very fast or, very, or not go up very fast. So you could be sitting there, not doing anything, and your heart, because it's beating irregularly, it may also beat fast. And if it's beating fast, it may be going at 100 beats per minute when you're sitting. Normally, if you had a normal heart rhythm, your heart would be expected to go at about 70 beats per minute when you're just sitting down. But if your heart is going at 100 beats per minute, you will feel like you're doing an activity to make your heart go at 100 beats per minute. I, you'll feel almost like you've been doing some brisk walking or something like that. Now, the next problem is, if it's going at 100 beats per minute, and you then start walking or you start running, it could shoot up to 170 or 180 beats per minute. Okay, And then you will feel like you're doing an activity or you've just done an activity to make your heart go up to 180. So you may just be walking along, okay, but you may feel that you've just run a marathon because your heart is behaving as if you've just run a marathon. And that's because of this electrical um, disturbance, atrial fibrillation, and this lack of rate control. So there are two aspects to why people get symptoms. Some people get symptoms because their heart may be racing, okay? Not, nece not necessarily just because of the rhythm, but just because the heart rate is racing very fast. And some people get their symptoms simply because the heart is beating irregularly and they've lost that extra bit of blood that would normally be pumped out of the heart. And therefore, we see all these different medications being used, but largely the strategy to try and improve symptoms can be boiled down to two. The, number one, rate control, i.e. you control the heart rate and stop the heart rate going very fast. And for a lot of people, that makes them feel significantly better. And then the second option is rhythm control. And those are the people who are referred for a shock treatment to try and get their heart beating regularly again. When you're doing rate control, you're letting the heart beat irregularly. You're letting the patient be in atrial fibrillation. All you're doing is you're stopping the heart going, working much harder than it needs to. So you can still, you'll still be in atrial fibrillation, but instead of your heart going at 100, you can give people medications like beta blockers, digoxin, calcium blockers to stop the heart going that fast. Okay, and if the heart isn't working that fast, then you may not necessarily feel like you've done an activity that's made you go that fast. I, you won't necessarily get so breathless or tired, etc. But so that's one strategy, the rate control. And then there's the other strategy, which is okay, let's get them out of the atrial fibrillation altogether. Okay, which is shock the heart or give them medications like flecainide or amiodarone or even do an ablation, you know, the ablation for atrial fibrillation that people are having these days. Those are all strategies to control rhythm, okay? So the idea is if you control the rhythm, you've controlled uh, the rate as well because if the rate is a byproduct of the rhythm, but you could either just control the rate and leave the patient in atrial fibrillation or you can try and get them out of atrial fibrillation. Neither of these strategies really influence risk. Both these strategies are designed purely to try and improve symptoms, okay? So I, re I put out a video of fibrillation, and a lot of people came back to me and said, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, da, 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 you know, um, if I don't have an ablation, I'll be in AFib and the AFib will not go away. And I know that the AFib will keep getting worse. But the point is this, okay? 
you have to know which of these so you have to ask yourself what is a better strategy is it better to try and just control the heart rate and leave the patient in atrial fibrillation or is it better to get them out of the atrial fibrillation which works better what is better for in the long run okay both are designed to improve symptoms so to my mind look you know you control the rate and if the patient says look i'm symptom free is that better or is it better to get them out of atrial fibrillation somehow and then they come back and say well i'm symptom free which is the better strategy and so there was a very interesting study which was done and I want to share that with you. Now, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was published in 2002. And if anyone is interested, I'll try and put the um, uh, citation and the paper up on my Facebook page. Okay. So basically, they wanted to answer this question. They wanted to try and work out, is it better to try and in the long run, for the patient, is it better to leave them in atrial fibrillation and just control the heart rate, okay? Or is it better to get them out of the atrial fibrillation? So what they did was they took about 4,000 patients, okay? All of these patients were at least 65 years of age, and they, were, they had other conditions like diabetes and high blood pressure, etc. And what they did was they divided them into two groups. They divided them into one group, they wanted to control the rate, okay? So they weren't bothered about trying to get the patient out of atrial fibrillation. All they wanted to do is give the patient beta blockers, digoxin, calcium blockers, whatever it took to stop the heart rate going too fast when the patient was uh, sitting or exercising. But the patient remains in atrial fibrillation. Then they had another group in which they tried everything they could to try and get the patient back into a normal heart rhythm. All right. And so there were around about 2,000 patients in each of these groups, and they followed these people up to see what happens to them. Okay. And so, um, and the groups were relatively evenly matched. So there was no real difference between the two groups. You know, you had similar numbers of uh, similar age groups, similar comorbidities, etc. But the most interesting thing was that they said that after three and a half years, of following these people up, what they found was there was no difference. Okay, they found that the um, that there was no difference between rhythm control and rate control, um, and in fact, they said there was a trend towards a high, slightly higher mortality in patients with rhythm control, but it wasn't significant. So essentially what you have to say, after three and a half years, there was no significant difference between the two, comorb uh, the, the two strategies. Both strategies, uh, the stroke risk uh, was similar. Both strategies, the risk of death was similar. There was no real difference. And that is why it is really important to understand that when you're um, thinking about symptoms, etc., you're doing it just to improve your symptoms. It doesn't matter how you improve your symptoms. It doesn't matter whether your symptoms improve just by controlling um, your AF rate. So if you take beta blockers and you feel fine, just because you're an AF, that doesn't mean that you're going to do worse than someone who has had an ablation and had their symptoms improved because they're now supposedly out of atrial fibrillation. So it doesn't really, the studies don't prove that one is better than the other. You're having it done for symptoms, okay? If you're having rate control and your symptoms aren't better, then it's very reasonable to go and try a rhythm control strategy to see if your symptoms can get better, okay? Uh, but you are doing it for symptoms. What you don't need to think, what people worry about a lot is to say, oh, well, I'm still in AFib and the AFib can only get worse. Well, it can't. How does it get worse? Because you're in AFib. So we know it, atrial fibrillation is atrial fibrillation. What you're trying to say is, well, if I'm in AFib, maybe I'll do badly in the long run by remaining in atrial fibrillation compared to someone that had an ablation and is out of atrial fibrillation. But the studies that were done at that time, and it is true to say that this was before the ablation era, 
uh, did not show any significant difference between rate versus rhythm control strategies. So I hope this is useful. I'm going to do another few videos tonight, hopefully. Uh, and um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Drop me a line. Uh, this is me. Hang on. Here we go. This is me. Where is it? Uh, Sanjay Gupta, I'm a cardiologist. OK, now tons of people say, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about because he's not an electrophysiologist. I'm not an electrophysiologist. I'm not claiming to be an electrophysiologist. I'm not the best person to talk to if you say, well, what technique would you use for an ablation? But I do send a ton of people for, I do manage a ton of people with atrial fibrillation. I do send many people for ablation. I do see them when they've had their ablation. I do send many, I do manage people with rate control. And what I'm trying to share with you here is just what my strategy is. Ultimately, you know, as a patient, your body is your body and you have to do what is right for you. Okay, I can only give you general advice based on the research that people largely follow these days. I, most medical professionals will rely on this study, the AFFIRM study, to guide them that actually there is really no difference between rate control versus rhythm control to improve symptoms in atrial fibrillation. Uh, my Facebook page is here. Okay, and you can also email me on that. And my website is here, yourcardiology.co.uk. And I really wanted to share the More Than Just Medicine um, YouTube page and also the More Than Just Medicine website, which is um, me and a colleague of mine, Dr. Smale, who's a gastroenterologist. And we're trying to try, we're trying to get together and produce more videos and produce programs, etc., which work with lifestyle to try and improve lifestyle in the hope that that would help people um, cope or manage their illnesses a lot better. Great. So thank you so much. Please keep the comments coming. I really, really, really appreciate them. And I appreciate your questions. And um, it's always good to have people join in on my Facebook page because then I can interact with them a lot more. Thank you so much. Bye.